Y'all, the October challenge is off the chain. We finished week one. We just started week two today and it is a beast, but we are getting it in and we are really enjoying Trap and Tone. At least I'm enjoying it, y'all. I feel like I'm getting into the best shape of my damn life with Kiara Lachey. Y'all can sign up for the challenge. You won't be eligible to get any of the prizes, but you can actually get the workouts from going to ifyoucanmove.com and signing up. Okay, tell them that Bondi Blue sent you. Y'all can use my email, bondi.britney at gmail.com, which is always down below in the description box, along with the link for the website. And also, don't forget to try the TLCT, y'all. Nutriverse, I live by it, okay? Y'all think we be playing all of the reality stars and everybody be trying to sell y'all the Nutriverse and the T, and y'all think we bullshitting with y'all. Y'all can keep playing if y'all want to, but y'all see us. Okay, we're getting it together. I ain't all the way there yet, but I'm on my way. I'm better than I was five months ago. Six months ago, child, I'm better than I was this whole time. Okay, so if y'all trying to get in shape, you're trying to start your workout journey, please check out Kiara Lachey and if you can move.com. And also, if you want to purchase TLCT or any of their products, the Nutriburst, please buy it from me. Link down below. All right. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your girl Bondi Blue and I am back for Love After Lockup, y'all. All right, in case you were interested, this unit is from Tanache Hair. I did a video about it, I think probably about two years ago. Um, if you search it on my videos, you'll find it, I'm sure, but I'll try to make a playlist if I remember. Anyway, you guys, let's go ahead and get into the show. So let's start off with Sean and Destiny. Hmm. So, Destiny damn near gave Sean a heart attack when she waited until the last minute to show up for her court date, but she did show up after she ignored all of his phone calls, which I knew she was doing on purpose because she's like, you know, I'm, I'm coming, man, I'm on my way. Why are you freaking out? Well, because you have said before that you will run and that you do like to run and it's a thing for you. So when this man is nervous that you may run away with his $50,000, excuse him, but you shouldn't have to ask for that type of money out of somebody that you just met if you don't plan up showing up for court. Now, like I said, she showed up. She showed up with three minutes to spare. Who knows how long it took her to get through security, but Sean is just happy that she showed up and got there so he would not have to pay $50,000 because her raggedy ass didn't show up. Everybody's nervous for her, okay, because they don't know what's going to happen with this case. But I just kind of feel like anybody that's bold enough to just cut the ankle monitor off and mail it back to the people, then you should be bold enough to go in court and take whatever lick you got coming to you Okay, because that's just stupid to me. I don't know how you thought that was going to work out. Like, <laughs> did you really think they was going to be like, oh, okay, well, I guess we should just not worry about it. That's not how any of this works. She is just a headache to me, y'all. And I don't know why this man has decided to make his life harder by, you know, being her gimme, gimme boy. You know what I'm saying? Gimme, 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 gimme. That's all she going to do to you until you don't have nothing left to give to yourself or your six children that you didn't left that lady with. Oh, Lord, that poor lady who had all them children for you. Well, next time, maybe you'll stop at baby number two before you continue to have children for a man that has not married you. But whatever. John and Christiana, y'all, they the saddest story of the whole episode. So John takes in Christiana's mama and sister this episode, right? Mind you, the sister had her mama living above a meth house, and she used to be down in the basement with them cooking the meth. So y'all know she on drugs too. So it's amazing to me how she shows up on the show like she's clean and drugs are no longer an issue for her. Well, it don't seem that way to me. Okay, the only time it seemed as if she was worried about the drug situation is when John asked her to go and look for Christiana because they get a phone call from the halfway house saying that Christiana has left. She's not there anymore. They don't know what's going on. They're not at a liberty to say. And now he's worried about her. He's worried that she relapsed. He doesn't know where she is. So he says to the mom and sister, I have to go look for her. Tara, that's the sister, why don't you come help me? You know where she would hang out. You know where she would be. She was like, no, I can't do it, no. And she's probably gonna run away from you anyway because when she's on drugs, that's all she cares about. You know, basically, I think trying to make him feel like there was no point in him going out there to look for her and putting himself in danger, like just wait for her to come back to you. But John is not that type of person. He's a very proactive person and he cares about her. So there's no way he was gonna be able to 
sleep that night not knowing if she was safe or not. So he left their asses at his house. I would not have done that. I just do not feel like that man's possessions, as little as they may be, are safe around that sister. Okay, you had your poor mama who is on an oxygen machine living above a meth house, okay? Somewhere where they cook meth. I don't know if y'all know, but the fumes from meth will like permanently damage you. They will harm you. So this lady on oxygen and you got her staying above the meth lab. So all of the fumes are coming up into the apartment where that lady was probably staying at. I just was like, that's terrible. You don't even care about your mama. Like I'm, I'm just saying, I would never put my mama in harm's way like that, but I also don't do meth. So <laughs> there's that. Either way, John at nighttime, mind you, goes out there to get his woman. And I was just like, wow, John, you a real one. Cause he really cares about her. He just was like, I, I just need to find her. I need to know that she's okay. He actually ends up finding her out in a parking lot somewhere. And she looked like she was really cold and she didn't look high. She didn't look high when he found her and she didn't run away from him. She actually ran towards him and hugged him and got into the car and seemed grateful that he showed up to get her. She said that she was triggered. And she made a mistake and she was actually afraid that he was going to like shun her or be upset with her because, you know, she relapsed. But really, he was very supportive and he was there for her and he says he loves her and he's going to be there for her. And I was just like, wow, I don't know if that lady has ever gotten that type of love from anybody. I don't even know if she's been able to get it from her family, but it just made me feel hopeful for her. This drug habit that she has made me feel sad for her because I feel like, ma'am, you are only getting older. And the longer you can you continue to do hard drugs like this, the, the more damage you're doing to your body. You've already done damage to your body and you're continuing to do damage to your body. The thing about it is for me, the way I figure it, as you get older, I might be wrong, but as you get older, it becomes harder for your body to bounce back from doing hard drugs. So you either stay on them or when you get off of them, it eventually causes you health issues. So I just kind of feel like it would be in her best interest to just honestly get into a rehab facility. I don't know how they can do that, but I feel like she does not need to go back to jail and she damn sure don't need to go back to the halfway house with everybody who she used to either buy or do drugs with. Like that just... That is not a safe place for that lady to be in. I don't know how they thought that she was supposed to actually get better with a drug habit. If you put her in a halfway house where people are selling drugs, doing drugs, like it's just, it's sad to me. Her story is really sad to me and I hope she gets her life together. I'm sure somebody in the comments will give me um, an update of whatever is going on. Dylan and Heather, y'all, I want Dylan to find him a nice girl that has a regular job that doesn't want Dylan to go back to jail just so she can have sex with him in a nasty motel or whatever the hell they was going to when Heather decided that she would rather get on the road instead of going into the bedroom at her Aunt Diane's house, okay? Just exactly what her ass ended up doing at the end of this episode is what she could have done from the very beginning instead of pitching this bitch fit because Dylan was having a conversation with her Aunt Diane and the other auntie. And I just kind of was like, bitch, what is wrong with you? I feel like she on drugs. Like, I don't know what's wrong with her, but she on something because you more worried about some D that you could have got if you would have just can we get a minute and slipped him into the bedroom got your d right quick took a damn nap and let that man be courteous and nice to your aunt diane that is letting her wayward niece and her ex kind freshly out of jail old man stay in her house like you crazy the way she acted, y'all, the parole officer showed up looking for Dylan. It's his first day out. He should have stayed his ass at that house and let her bug out and do whatever she needed to do. But he decided to hop in that car with her. Either way, the PO shows up. He shows the PO his identification. He's very nice and cordial and respectful. And of course, the PO who looked like, I don't even want to be here anyway, was just like, all right, dude, you here? Be here next time I come here. This is a slap on the wrist. But don't fool with me because I'll lock your ass up again. And left it at that, okay? He and Heather get back into the house. She throw Aunt Diane a little apology on her way to the bedroom. And then they go, you know, back there to make nasty while I, I Diane and the other auntie just sit in the living room in a quiet hearing them moan. I was just like, you know what, Heather? <laughs> 
What is going on with Heather? I forgot. What happened to her house? I don't know, but she works on my nerves and I'm just worried that she is going to be the downfall of Dylan. I feel bad for him because I don't even think he really want to be with her. I think for one, he's scared to leave her alone because her ass is manic. And for two, I think he feels indebted to her because she got him through his time in jail. But if she ain't meant to be with you when you out of jail, then drop her crazy ass off quickly. Run. Don't tell her when you leave. Just get your duffel bag and disappear. Because if you try to tell her, she gonna follow you. That whole crazy. Listen to me, Dylan. Run. So y'all, Lindsay and Scott. Last episode, Scott nosy ass was reading Lindsay's journals. Okay, he shouldn't have been doing that. But in the journal, he finds... Uh, you know, little paragraph where she's talking about finding a man to help her in her transition from prison. Pay for her, take care of her, put her up in a nice house until she finds something better to do, basically. It basically says she was going to find a trick to use, and that's exactly what she did. And the situation with Scott is very similar to the one that she wrote out in his journal. Obviously, somebody that knows about ma manifesting by writing down, okay? She knew what she was doing. She lied to him and said it was an excerpt from a book. He said, find the damn book then. And she couldn't find the book because it's not from a book. It's something that you wrote down. I don't know why you just don't admit it and say, well, Scott, I mean, you know I want somebody to take care of me. What's the problem? If you and I work out, I won't have to find something else to do or somebody else to do. Okay, but then she had the audacity to open up her mouth and say he doesn't have enough money for her to be with him just for his money. I said, you's a damn lie. You don't have shit. How you gonna say this man don't have enough money when you don't have any money, ma'am? Like, y'all, Lindsay is crazy. Then she decides that she's pissed off at him, so she wants to change her address and move back to her mom's house. And I'm just kind of like, explain to me why you wouldn't have moved in with your mom and your daughter off rip. Why would you move in with this man off rip? And then you're going to sit up there and cry. Oh, I've never been away from my daughter. Really? You haven't? What about when you was in jail? What about when you was making terrible decisions that landed you in prison and away from your daughter from all those years? What about then? <sighs> Y'all, Lindsay don't make no damn sense. She really don't. Then she hiding something else from him. I don't know what she could possibly be hiding, but we already know she's not to be trusted. If Scott trusts her, he's a damn fool, and he obviously don't know the situation that he's gotten himself into. Use a sugar daddy, she's a sugar baby, okay? If you think she with you for any other reason besides your money, you are sadly mistaken, sir. And if you want to believe her lies, then you go ahead and do so. But don't get upset when you already know what it's hitting for. Child, Tyrese finally finds out what happened to Shonda. Shonda up and disappeared on that man. But really, his tacky blue suit turned her off. And she said when they kissed, she didn't feel anything. It's been three months since she got out of jail. She says that she just ghosted Tyrese and he wouldn't stop calling. So she turned off the phone and changed her phone number. She sits down and talks to production. Production asks her to call Tyrese. She calls Tyrese and tells him she's sorry she ghosted him, but she didn't feel any chemistry with him, and she needed to get her life together and focus on herself. He pissed off and feels like, I wish you would have told me that instead of making me worry about you. You could have just said what it was. She says, well, I mean, I would like to be friends with you, and he was like, no, I don't want to be your motherfucking friend. Good day. And hangs up the phone. And I'm like, he gonna go cry in the car. But his daughter, his son, us, we all tried to tell him. We all tried to warn him. You need to stick to the churches and the grocery stores that you used to. And stay away from 20-something-year-old white women coming out of prison. Like, they're only going to use you, Tyrese. It does not matter that you have a nice life and, and you know, a nice body shape and you work out and you can cook. It doesn't matter. You know who that matters to? Women your age. Find one. Oh, shit. Just find a young woman who got a baby and need an old man to take care of her. Like, that's all you really got to do out here. I don't know why you tricking off girls in jail. Like, <laughs> dude, help yourself. Then Maurice and Jessica, they go to her parents' house. And her dad is showing Maurice how to weld. It seems as, you know, that's what he does. And it was cool because I felt like Maurice is really searching for a father figure and really looking for another way to live his life. And Jessica's family 
can really provide and afford him with that. And it's not even about money. It's just about the familiar relationship. If they like you, they'll help you. You know what I'm saying? Even in my own family, like if we can get you a job, we can get you a job. Like that's just how things work. You know what I'm saying? Like it makes no sense to me um, to not help people when they need the help. You know what I'm saying? Cause at the end of the day, if they do the work, they did that on their own. All you did was make a phone call and have a conversation, which ain't nearly as much as showing up for the job interview, getting the job and then actually doing the work. You know what I'm saying? So either way, I do understand where Maurice is coming from, but he comes off too eager and it makes me cringe. Every time him and the daddy have a scene together, the daddy is just like, yeah, but please don't hurt my daughter. Please protect my daughter. Don't steal nothing out my house. You know, just all of that. You could just tell that that's the energy. He's trying with him, but he also feels like Maurice is somebody that knows how to run a good game and talk good shit. And you can talk all day, but will you actually come through when it comes time to take care of my daughter? So y'all know that Jessica is pregnant. Maurice wasn't supposed to say anything, but he's so excited and for some reason thinks that that's good news. He tells that to the daddy while they're working together. And the daddy is like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to that. And he's like, look, I'm going to take care of my wife. I'm going to take care of my child. I would really like to get her a ring and have a real wedding, the whole nine. Um, but I'm going to do what I have to do to take care of my family. The daddy pulls out $1,000 out of his pocket and hands it to him and says, go get her a nice ring. Don't spend the money gambling. Don't spend it on liquor. Get the ring, pay me my money back. It's a loan. Maurice is like, oh my God, nobody ever gave me $1,000. My aunties, like, because they black disenfranchised people that have not had access to wealth. That's why they were not able to throw $1,000 your way. If you were in the same socioeconomic racial standing as Jessica's parents, then you would be better off as well. Like the whole idea that, Black people is just out here making poor decisions for no reason at all. Like, no. It's about access. He has probably had access his whole damn life. Parents and everything else. Bank loans, nice neighborhoods, good schools, the benefit of the damn doubt and everything else. You and your people have not. That's why they can't hand you $1,000 out their pocket like it ain't nothing as a test. That man gave him that stack as a test. The first thing he say in the confessional, I can go and gamble this and triple it. The man just told you don't do that. Please do us all a favor. Buy this girl a little cheap ring. Okay, real diamond, not that big, less than a thousand. Shoot for eight or nine hundred. That way you can have an extra two hundred to a hundred dollars in your pocket to take her to a restaurant somewhere to present her with the damn ring. Or better yet, put the shit in your pocket and save it for a rainy day. Or better yet, when you got to get that man his money back. But whatever, I digress. I don't know if Maurice is going to pass the test. Because I get what the daddy sees. You seem real slimy, Maurice. You really do. You seem like you know how to talk. But, you know, it ain't always about, oh, I ain't never had nobody show me this. Sometimes it's about, oh, I know I can game somebody, so I'm going to say all the right things, okay? Now, I would hope he wouldn't be doing that with this woman who he's married, but you just never know, okay? You just never know. So, y'all, we going to see. But the episode was good. I enjoyed Love After Lockup. What about you? Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel if you have not already. I love y'all, and I'll see y'all in the next one.